This morning we're going to depart from the Gospel of John and we're going to look at the, at the Palm Sunday story. Of course today, uh, the day that the church celebrates the entrance of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, himself being recognized as the king of the nation. We're going to look at a couple of different passages here. We're going to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So if you would open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, just look at a couple of verses there and then we're gonna be primarily in the Gospel of Mark. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul is speaking here in, in a kind of a metaphorical, illustrative language, which I'll explain in a moment. So 2 Corinthians two fourteen. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we, are to God the fragrant, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death to death and to the other the aroma of life to life. Let me read that again. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us he diffuses or spreads the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death to death and to the other the aroma of life to life. Keeping that in mind, if you turn over to the Gospel of Mark uh, chapter 11, we read Mark's account of Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem. Now when they came near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the village opposite you and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat, loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street and they loosed it. And some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? So they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded and they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments on it and he sat on it. And many spread their garments on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple, so when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for each one that's here. Thank you for every life, God, that has gathered together uh, in this place. Thank you, God, that you love us. We truly, truly want to draw our hearts near to you, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for all that you've done in sending your son, Father, to go to the cross so that we could receive forgiveness for our sins and have new life in you. Thank you for that new life that you offer. Lord, we pray that every person here today would receive that new life, would have that new life, would know Jesus. So Lord, we commit it to you. Thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Get situated here. Um, great quote by David Gusick here. Let me read that. He says, he says this, we call this event the triumphal entry, but it was a strange kind of triumph. If you spoke to Jesus' triumphal, if you spoke of Jesus' triumphal entry to a Roman, they would have laughed you in the face. For them, a triumphal entry was an honor granted to a Roman general who won a complete and decisive victory and had killed at least 5,000 enemy soldiers. When the general returned to Rome, they had an elaborate parade. First came the treasures captured from the enemy, then the prisoners. His armies marched by unit by unit, and finally the general rode in on a golden chariot pulled by magnificent horses. Priests burned incense in his honor and the crowds shouted his name and praised him. The procession ended at the arena where some of the prisoners were thrown to wild animals for the entertainment of the crowd. That was a triumphal entry. Not a Galilean peasant sitting on a few coats set out on a pony. 
The picture that the Apostle Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians is, is based on an illustration known by the people that he was writing to. As David Gusick uh, quotes and as he kind of tells us, a Roman general, when he would have a great victory, there would be a great procession. I mean, th think of it, uh, you know, if, if your team wins the World Series or something like that, or if your basketball team wins NBA championship. We're getting close, folks, okay? In case you don't know. There's usually like a parade and people come out and are cheering and the, you know, the, the players speak and, and you know, if they're really excited, they'll try to sing Keep On Believin' you know, by Journey or whoever. And, uh, so you know, we, we understand these victory parades. For the Roman general, he would, he would march uh, the prisoners, he, he would display the treasures and the things that they had gathered. Uh, the soldiers would march. The people would burn uh, incense in honor of the general and they would shout out his praise. So this, there was this parade that was going on and there would be great celebration. There would be the prisoners. There would be the things that were won in the battle. There would be the fragrance and the aroma of the incense and it would be associated with kind of worshiping and adoring the general and they would be shouting out his name. And Paul uses that illustration for the body of Christ. He says, we as Christians in our own way, not in a big pompous kind of way, but we are to be people, and, and we are people, not just to be, but we are people, who bring the fragrance of Christ wherever we go. Kind of just when you show up, as, as you're walking with Jesus, as you're walking in the Spirit, when you show up, Jesus shows up to some degree. It's kind of like somebody that walks into a room and has a real distinctive cologne or perfume, right? Sometimes it's nice, sometimes not so nice. It's like, wow, you got that on sale, didn't you? You know, <laughs> some colognes or perfumes are better than others. But what a sweet thing it is when somebody walks in and there's just a, fr a real pleasant fragrance and the scent about them. And so that's kind of the idea when a Christian shows up, he's kind of likening it unto that, that victory parade of the general. There's, there's a fragrance in the air. It's associated with a victory and there's great celebration. But the general comes in as this conquering general on this, in this chariot pulled by these amazing horses and he's really, it's a real show of power. And, and we are told that Jesus had his triumphal entry but it didn't look anything like a Roman general's entry. It was completely, completely the opposite because his kingdom, his army, his, his purpose was not of this world, it was for another world and another reason. And so as David says here, if you would have asked a Roman citizen about the triumphal entry of Jesus, they would have laughed in your face. You call that a triumph? That's a joke. He's riding on a little baby colt that's never been ridden on and these peasants are throwing down palm branches and they're closing the road and there's a couple of coats on the back of the animal and they're waving branches and that's, that's it? And so to the, to the natural human eye, it doesn't seem like much, but to those who have the eyes of God and, the, and faith in God, it's a crowning moment for Jesus. So kind of where we're going with this, kind of the, the title of, of the message, if you look at your notes there, the triumphal entry, how do you see it? And how you interpret what happened that day really shapes you know, so much about our lives. So let's work our way through this here. The triumphal entry was a planned event. Jesus had spoken clearly of his death. I have some, some notes here and some other references. If you would follow along, uh, turn a couple pages to the left in your Bible to Mark chapter eight. Just wanna kind of uh, get this in our minds about what Jesus was doing and had been doing with his disciples, seeking to prepare them for what was coming. Mark chapter eight, verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke this word openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, some people would say that Peter was demon possessed at this point. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. But what Jesus is saying is that thought does not come from heaven. The thought of trying to dissuade me from going to the cross comes from hell. Because if Jesus goes to the cross, he dies for the sins of the world and people can be saved. Peter here is speaking, guys, like a natural man. Look what he says here. You, ha you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Now, if I was Peter and Jesus was like, 
you know, my new best friend and my rabbi and my master and my teacher, and he's telling me he's going to go die on a cross, I'm going to say, no, we can't let that happen. That's just a natural human affection. But, it's, but as I said, it's just natural. It's not, it's not heavenly minded, it's earthly minded. And so Peter is not viewing and understanding the upcoming crucifixion for the purposes that God intends for it. He's seeing it as a defeat, not a victory. Let's continue on. Mark chapter 9, verse 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 9, down to verse 12. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, Elijah does come first and restores all things. And how is it written that this, concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? So he's preparing them Elijah being a reference to the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist coming, preparing people's hearts, saying, repent, turn your heart away from the things of the world, turn your hearts away from sin. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus here is once again is preparing his disciples, explaining to them, I've got to go to the cross. I'm, just, I'm going to keep pounding this point home. And the, and the reason is this, guys, because... As far as human nature goes, we're no different than these people were. We're no different than these guys. We can, we can view so much of what God does back then and even now, we can view it just in a natural sense. And may God help us, amen? May God help us to say, Lord, I want to see these things the way that you see them. I want to see every issue of my life the way that you see it, not the way that my natural self wants to interpret it. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was going before them and they were amazed. I think they're amazed and the other gospel tells us because it, it, one of the gospel writers says that Jesus set his face like flint and I believe that's a quote from Isaiah. Jesus just had this determination. It's like his countenance changed when it was time to go to Jerusalem. When it was time to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, Isaiah says he set his face like flint. It was like he, his countenance was just like, I'm going and nobody and nothing is stopping me. And it says here in chapter 10, verse 32, as he was going up to Jerusalem, Jesus was going before them and they were amazed. And I think that's why, because he's marching towards the cross and he knows he's marching towards the cross. And it's not an accident, it's planned. And they're looking at him, and if we had time to cross-reference other verses, it, it, would, it would be evident. They're looking at him, and they're amazed, like, wow, what's this look about? What's going on here? And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and on the third day he will arise. Now, it's no wonder that Jesus had this look, and they were amazed and they were afraid. I mean, this, this guys, is the reason that he came. The teaching was secondary, the miracles were secondary, everything else was secondary compared to going to the cross. And so he had been telling them, this was a, a clearly spoken statement about an event that was planned in all of eternity. The triumphal entry was the plan of God to present Jesus as the Messiah. It's no accident. It's no happenstance. The releasing of the cult may or may not have been miraculous. Some say that Jesus planned for it three months ahead of time, right when we were in the Gospel of John, if you remember. They're visiting uh, Jerusalem ahead of time. He may have made arrangements for it. He may have not. But everything else that happened was, was an absolute fulfillment of prophecy. The setting was Jerusalem, the beginning of the Passover feast. The Passover, and this is the time when Jesus is going. And, and this, this kind of this week, here in our lives, it, it was this week in their calendar that they remembered being set free from Egypt, from the slavery of Egypt. 400 years as a nation in slavery. So they were celebrating that. Jewish pilgrims would come from all over the nation. Uh, Jerusalem would be, you know, you know how all the hotels sell out at, during Bottle Rock? <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> you guys know about Bottle Rock, huh? <laughs> it was like that. I mean, you know, during Bottle Rock, people are renting rooms for like exorbitant, you can stay at my house for $300 a night. I'll take it, you know, because there's nowhere to stay. That's how it was at Jerusalem at the time of Passover. People were camping out, staying anywhere that they could. The city was absolutely packed with people, absolutely packed with pilgrims. It was a celebration. It was a time of, of remembering God's faithfulness. It was also a time of anticipating the Messiah. And if you've been with us through the Gospel of John, if you've been with us with, with the church for a while, you know that the nation of Israel was looking for a political savior, not a spiritual savior. Everything about what Jesus did right now was not clear to them. Peter says, you're not going to go to the cross. They don't understand what he's doing. They want to prevent the whole thing. If Jesus, if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, there's no salvation. And so it's a real kind of strategic time in the mind and in the plan of God. Look at, look at your notes here. Look at the quote from Luke 19. This is a parallel passage of, of this event. It says, as Jesus drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. As he comes down the Mount of Olives, as he's on, on the back of this little colt, Jerusalem is to the west, Mount of Olives is to the east. Mount of Olives is about 700 feet, uh, about a rise of 700 feet. Um, we've been there on our trips to Israel. You come down over the top of the Mount of Olives and there's a beautiful view of Jerusalem right there. And it says, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, and I'll elaborate on that in a moment. This your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. If you study the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verses 25, 26, and other verses, there's a lot of evidence that point to the fact that the people should have recognized Jesus as their king. They should have recognized the timing of it. And I don't think Jesus is saying in a happenstance or a casual kind of fashion, especially in this your day. I don't think Jesus kind of just throws his words around. I believe that God had an expectation that the people would be expecting their Messiah. Now, when they see him, they, they, they rejoice, but they rejoice for a lesser reason than for what he came for. The unwritten cult as spoken of in Zechariah 9, verse 9. It was an intentional thing to present Jesus as king. Zechariah 9, 9. Hundreds of years ahead of time, the Jewish scriptures said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Well, why? Because your king is coming. He's just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's really specific. That's really specific. Compare that to the mindset of the Roman general coming behind a chariot or coming on a chariot. It's a really specific statement about the arrival of the King of Israel, the Messiah of Israel. That's why I believe in Luke chapter 19, Jesus is saying, you should have known. This is your moment. The people's expectation and response down at the bottom of page one in your notes. They're saying here, Hosanna. The word Hosanna is a Hebrew word that means save now. So they see Jesus, the disciples are there. This is the first and only time really that Jesus is going to be allowed, is going to allow them in his human life to praise him as the conquering king or as the coming king. And so the people are, are, are saying, Hosanna, save us, Lord. And most of you know, some of you don't. They are occupied by Rome right now. There's an occupying force and they want Rome removed. Let me read Psalm 118. The people underst guys, the, the, people ha the people had the information. Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Chief cornerstone is the stone that you start with when you're building a structure. From that stone, you measure this way, and you measure that way, and you measure up. From that stone, everything else is calculated. And it's a spiritual reference to Jesus being the cornerstone of God's work in humanity. From him, everything goes out and this way and that and up and everything else. And the one with whom the work of God for humanity starts was rejected. And it was prophesied ahead of time. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Now, we, we say that a lot, don't we, as believers? I, I, I'm Facebook friends with a lot of you guys. I see you write that on your, on your this is the day the Lord is, we'll be rejoiced and be glad in it. That, that, that's a great verse. But it specifically talks about this, this one day when Jesus wrote in, I believe. If of all the days, guys, stop and think about it a second. Of all the days that people should rejoice, it's when God is commencing and God is starting his process of salvation. Of all the days, should, should people rejoice in the days before? Sure, absolutely. God sends the rain. God causes the wheat to grow. God causes the corn to grow. God causes the sheep to, to, to multiply, et cetera, et cetera. We have babies. We have work. We're, we're, we're thankful. And I'm talking about the Hebrew people, not us. I don't, do you got any of you guys raise sheep? You guys, you guys don't raise sheep. Okay. Should, we should be joyful every day. But this is the day. I believe that's the context. That's, that's kind of the, that, the weight of the message. This is the day the Lord has made. Of all the days that we're going to be joyful, we're going to be joyful this day because the process of salvation has begun. The clock here has officially started. We, we hit the go button on the stopwatch, and now, now everything is in motion. Take in Psalm 118 again. Let me read it. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, notice the next thing they say. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is what the people are quoting. And they're seeing Jesus as a king who was there to save them. The Bible tells us they, they put down the palm branches, the clothes on the ground. Historically, palm branches signaled a victory celebration. And for the poor to put clothing on the ground and have an animal walk over it, there could be some damage to the clothes there, right? It cost them something. It cost them something to worship the Lord. They were doing it in faith, and it was costly, they were emotional, needy, desperate, and willing to put forth the effort. We also know that the Jewish leadership protested against this. Now, here's the guys that really understood it, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders who had perhaps more of an insight into the scriptures. Look at, look at your notes here from the Gospel of Luke in a parable, uh, parallel passage, excuse me. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, "'Teacher, rebuke your disciples.'" Why are they saying that? They're saying that because they understand that Psalm 118 is about the Messiah. And these people are saying, we recognize you as Messiah, save now. And the leaders are saying, be quiet. This, this cannot be the guy. He's broken our Sabbath rules. He's claimed to be God in the flesh. This can't be the guy. And so there's this conflict going on, but the common people were accepting him and asking for salvation and asking for help. Jesus answered out of Luke 19, when they, when they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples, he said, I tell you, if, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Let me take a sip here. I don't even know how to compare this. I mean, I don't know, maybe you think about a thriller movie where there's a sequence of they're going to, I don't know, send off a nuclear missile and you need three people to push the launch sequence and it's a retina scan and you push in the code and this guy gets his eye scanned and pushes in the code and this guy gets his eye scanned and pushes in the code and everybody looks at the third guy and this guy gets his eye scanned and pushes in the code and then they all do the secret squirrel handshake, you know. And there's no turning back. And then the, 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 you know, the missile is launched and everybody is going, wow, it's in motion now. And I see, that as, I see this as that kind of thing. It's in motion now. The reason that Jesus came, now, I mean, it's all been leading up to this and now it's in motion. And the people are, are crying out to him, help us. We, we need help. And as, as we've talked about in recent weeks, a lot of people come to church or to come, you know, come to pray and come to worship when they need help. And there's probably no better place to go than to God when you need help. But you need more help than you think. 
You don't just need Jesus to solve your problems. You need him to save your soul. You need forgiveness for your sins. Not just to help you get through uh, an, an ugly divorce or some other thing that's going on in your life. And, and they, were, they were praising him, but for less than what he wanted to give them. And I just, you guys have seen that, right? You know, kind of people crying out to God and help me with this. And the problem gets solved and they're not crying out to God anymore. The other ones, the other leaders here are saying, boy, shut these people up. They don't understand what they're saying. And Jesus is like, well, they may not understand what they're saying, but they're saying the right thing. And even if they weren't saying, the rocks would worship, the rocks would cry out. By the way, I've, I have often thought, you know, maybe, maybe you come to church and you think you can't sing well. You can sing better than stones. <laughs> so just, the Bible doesn't say to make necessarily a pretty noise to the Lord. It says make a joyful noise to the Lord. So <laughs> just, just come and sing out to the Lord. <laughs> Jesus says, you know what? The retina scan has happened and the codes have been pushed and this thing is in motion and it's happening. All systems go. We are going forward now. And that's what's happening here. I've alluded to this. I've said it. Look at look, following your notes a little more. There's a misplaced expectation, incorrect interpretation, and there's wrong actions. The people wanted salvation but expected the wrong kind of salvation. Guys, if you're here today because you need help, fantastic. It's a great place to be. But don't come to Jesus just to solve a problem. Come because you recognize I need God in my life. I don't need a problem solver. I need God in my life. I need a Lord in my life. I need a Savior in my life. Be here for that. Whether you've said yes to Jesus or not, be here because you need him to be the Lord of your life and the Savior of your life. And you need him to be your all in all. They wanted to be free from the Roman army, these people. They wanted the kingdom of God ushered into Israel. They wanted to make Jesus their political king. We've read that in John chapter 6. Jesus was popular and wise and powerful and he could do miracles. And they had seen that. They knew about that. But he needed to first be a spiritual king and later a physical king. Look at ch uh, chapter 10, verse 35 and 40, if you would. This, this is the mindset that they had. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want, you, we want to, oh my goodness. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. When you drive out the, the Romans, we want to be vice president and secretary of state. Can we have those positions, please? Verse 38, but Jesus said to them, you, can't, you do not know what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? In other words, can you go through what I'm going to go through? And they said to him, we can. Or so they thought. They would die for him. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and be baptized. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. I keep saying this, and if you've been here, you know, for the last four or six weeks, you know, I was chatting uh, with, with Adam last night, and, and, you know, at the bottom of your page here, on the second page, we have some questions for the life groups, and it's like we kind of keep saying the same thing here, that people come to Jesus for lesser reasons and not the, not the best reasons. And these guys were excited about him, but for all the lesser reasons. And I ha we have to keep saying it because I can fall into it. You know, I, I, can, I, can, I can write on my Facebook page, uh, God is good. And, 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 uh, and why? Because I had a good week. Because my car didn't blow up and uh, the dog didn't, you know, bark and... and uh, you know, we came out ahead on our taxes. God is good. You know, came out ahead on our taxes. God is good. And, and, and I can just, I can, and I should be thankful for all those things, you know. Don't know about the taxes yet. We're still waiting, but that's just how, you know, I can be thankful for all those things. That's fantastic. Do you think maybe God wants to do more in my life than not have my dog barking and have me be good, do good on the taxes? Do you think maybe he wants to do more? 
And please forgive me. I'm not thinking of anybody in this room. Oh, I'm going to make enemies now, but I'm just going to say it anyway. So many people will take a picture of food and say, oh, God is good. Well, praise the Lord if you got that food. He's good if you don't have any food. Amen, Amen. Amen or not? Amen. He's good all the time. All the time, God is good. good is, God is good all the time. Has it boiled down to like, I have a great plate of food here. God is good. Is that all we want? <laughs> Sometimes that's all I want. I just want to have a good week. I want to be migraine free and not have any weird stuff happen and have some fun and do some of the things that I want to do. And et cetera. Do you think maybe he wants to do more? Yes, I think maybe he wants to do more. And so I don't mean to scold you, but maybe it's just kind of a holy challenge. These guys were saying, we just want you to do this. And he's like, gosh, I just want to do so much more. You want to praise me to drive out an army? I want to take you to heaven. It's kind of different than just driving out an army. Would driving out an army that oppresses you be good? Absolutely. Is it as good as going to heaven? Not even close. If Jesus drove out the army and took the throne of Israel and lived till he was 90, they would have had about 60 great years and then somebody else would have come in and conquered him and made life miserable again. His target was so much higher than what they wanted. And I just think it's just, it's just, by the way, the food thing, please, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to make anybody mad at me, okay? I was like, but, I, you know, I can, I can be the same way. Oh, God is good. I didn't break any guitar strings this week. Oh, praise the Lord, God is good. I, you know, I got 10% off on my next musical discount. Oh, praise the Lord, God is good. He probably wants more for me than just that. And I'm talking to me too. He probably wants more. And they're, they're just aiming low. Guys, I just want us to, to expect all from God that he has for us. Amen, guys? And he just wants to do so much, you know? These guys want to be vice president and secretary of state. And he's like, guys, <laughs> how about if you be one of, the, you know, one of the 12 pillars in my kingdom or something like that in heaven forever? They didn't understand their greatest need was for forgiveness of sins, not the removal of the Romans. Look at Mark chapter 15. By the end of the week, probably a lot of the people in this crowd are going to be turning against him. Let me just pick it up here. Uh, I'll read it. It's just good for us to read it. Mark 15, verse 1. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. This is only about four or five days later, by the way. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he, and he said to him, it is as you say. And the chief priest, priest accused him of many things, and he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, do you say nothing? See how many things they testify against you? And Jesus answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. At the feast, it was accustomed to, to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow insurrectionists, and they had committed murder in the insurrection. Then the multitude crying aloud, then the multitude Wait a minute, last Sunday you were saying, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, probably not all of them, but probably some of them are now, now they're saying, we don't, I guess we were wrong about this guy. He didn't do what we wanted him to do. The multitude crying aloud began to ask him to do just what he had always done for them. And Pilate asked them, do you want me to release to you the, the king of the Jews? For he knew the chief priest had handed him over because of envy, and the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. And Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they said, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him. Couldn't answer the question. He didn't do any evil. They just had their minds made up. He's not what we wanted. He didn't deliver. Kill him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. It's interesting, too, that the name Barabbas, Bar Abbas, Bar means son of, and Abba means father. The human son of the father was set free, and the divine son of the father was put to death. And there, there was this huge, massive shift in the people's minds, in their hearts. Look at chapter 16, verse 9, if you would. It 
Now, when he rose early in the first day of the week, this is after the resurrection, of course, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons, and she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, say it, they did not believe. How many times does Jesus have to tell somebody something (laughs) before they believe? They, They just didn't compute. What they wanted was less than what he came for. And so they just had trouble making the shift. They eventually did, of course, when he came and and appeared before them. They eventually did. But again, guys, I just want to make the point, you know, I just want to make the point, and and I, 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 I don't know. Do I have to apologize to anybody about the food thing? You guys okay with that? Okay. You guys know, you guys know what I mean, right? The Lord wants to do so much. He just wants to do so much. I'm, I'm challenged to say it. What does he want to do with my life? I just think it's human nature to set it on cruise control and just cruise. And, and, thank, and thank God that, that we didn't hit any speed bumps, you know? But he just wants to do so much. And they just had this wrong expectation of him. You know, after he was killed, here, and, and we're going to kind of wind down now, and if you have any questions, uh, if you want to text them in, we'll, I'll give it a shot in answering them. Looking back on the triumphal injury, look at your notes here. For a time, the disciples must have felt like the biggest fools on earth. They had thrown everything into following him, and then he, you know, my vernacular, goes and gets himself killed. Jesus, you were doing so well, and then you blew it in in, in their minds. But he was right on target with what needed to happen for you and I. They had given up everything to follow Jesus. Remember, they had been... He had given them power over demons. They had previously cast out demons. Now, when that was happening, they're thinking, we're on the right team. We're following Jesus, you know. They had healed the sick. They had seen miracles and heard the most incredible teaching ever spoken. During all of that, they're thinking, we're following the right guy. Then suddenly it ended with their teacher being executed and them hiding in fear. They expected the wrong thing from Jesus and were temporarily distraught. But I'll tell you, that must have been a serious short season of despair. Because they're not only like, boy, were we wrong, were we wrong to follow this guy? I wonder if they started blaming each other. Well, you're the one that brought me to him. Well, you're the one that said he was this and that, and I was dumb enough to follow you. And, you know, I wonder if they were... Th- Guys, they had to to follow a rabbi in in those days. You're walking away from your job. You're walking away from your occupation. You're walking away from your family. They had devoted about three three years, more or less, to follow him. Jesus was always controversial. What did their family say? Why are you following that guy? He seems a little crazy to me, you know? What are you doing following that guy? And now he's dead in the tomb, and they're thinking, maybe my family was right. Does the Bible say that? No. Is it, is it beyond the realm of human possibility? I think it's totally within human possibility. They're just going, oh my gosh, what have we done? You know, how stupid we were for a while. And then Jesus, of course, is raised from the dead, and they're like, wow, we didn't see that coming. How do you look back on the triumphal entry? You know, theologically, you know, we're on this side of it and we can say, well, it was perfect. Jesus was right on target and he was in the will of the Father and all of that. Maybe a modern day application is how do you you look on the work of God in your life now? If there's a setback in your life, is it suddenly God's not good anymore and you're not going to put any happy faces on your Facebook page or something, you know? Here's some questions that that we have for you guys to consider as you meet with your life groups. Uh, Starting tonight, some of them meet and and throughout the week. These are just things to gather us together and, and, and to discuss, guys. What's an Easter holiday tradition that you or your family had growing up that stands out to you? Just kind of a way that we get to know each other. Number two, the crowd risked something to worship Jesus. They also sacrificed coats and time and energy. How and should worship for the Christian be a risk and a sacrifice? May I, may I use this moment to, to encourage uh, all of you to come to church on time? Ouch, 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 ouch. 
There will be no Bible studies in heaven, but there will be endless worship. I, I appreciate that anybody ever wants to come and hear me talk. It's kind of amazing to me. Martin Lloyd-Jones said of himself that he wouldn't walk across the street to hear himself talk. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way. But there's no Bible studies in heaven. There's worship in heaven. May I encourage you, not a rebuke, may I invite you to make the effort to be with God's people corporately and when we hit the first note, you're ready to worship. May I encourage you even, could I even invite you, guys, that when we gather together, sometimes I think about this, and this will be a little bit of a... <laughs> you know, when, you, when we gather for a wedding, nobody's lingering in the foyer after it starts, right? Right? We don't... What, when we're gathering for a wedding, what are we doing? Shh, they're going to start. Let's get ready for a wedding, as it should be. But for worship? Is worship not a holy thing? Yes, it is, isn't it? Amen or no? Amen. It is a holy thing. Is it worth your effort to say, you know what? They're going to start. I'll talk to you later. How would it be if we came in ahead of time, what if, what if you came in ahead of time? You guys, you're going to have meet and greet later. There's going to be cookies in the patio later. There's going to be coffee. How would it be if each one of you came in and for five minutes before we even started singing together, you're already worshiping the Lord? John chapter 4, Jesus said, the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I just want to invite you guys. If, there's not, if worship is not a part of your life, you're not living the fullness of the Christian life. Just invite you to be here when we start. We're going to start without you. It's better to start with you. Start with us. Come and worship the Lord together, amen? Come and worship the Lord with us. The crowd risks something to worship Jesus, and they put time and energy into it. Are you? Do you? We should. Jesus is worthy of our praise, Amen? He's worthy of our praise. May we not treat worship casually or as an afterthought. We don't, we, don't, we don't treat weddings or sporting events that way or doily shows or whatever else we do. I, want, I really kind of want to make a point. How often are we like, shh, it's going to start. The movie's going to start. The concert's going to start. Oh, church started, I'll make it. We need to switch things. Number three, Jesus makes it clear that his death was God's plan and he gave his life freely. Yet in other parts of the Bible, the people's guilt in their murder of Jesus is portrayed as in Acts 32, 32. How do you reconcile these things? You guys can talk about that. Jesus gave his life and yet the people felt a measure of guilt. How do those two things reconcile? And they do. Number four, Jesus' disciples went from triumph to despair in the course of a few days how can we, as, as people who follow Jesus, avoid such roller coasters? How can God be so good one day and not so good the next, in our minds? How, how do we find a stable Christian life? Can I give you a hint? Don't have the wrong expectations of God. They had wrong expectations. If you have wrong expectations of God, God is not obliged to fulfill your wrong expectations. But he always keeps his promises, and his ways are good. Amen? His ways are always good. I don't know if you have any questions coming in. Yeah, we do. Bible notes in the NIV say, I'll get over here, out of the line of fire. Earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. What is the basis for including these verses, the source? Who decided to include them? Basically, there's two streams of Bible history. One stream includes these verses, other streams don't. There's a, what is called the Alexandrian texts, which are found in the Egypt area. There's another stream called the Textus Receptus. So NIV kind of stands apart by itself. Uh, the Textus Receptus has the, like the, uh, the King James, the New King James, I believe the New American Standard Bible. So there's two lines, and so... As people trace back kind of the authenticity of the Bible and how many manuscripts can be found, one stream of 
findings doesn't include these verses, the other stream does. Let me say this. If those verses don't belong there, it doesn't change the story because the story is still found in the Gospels. So best answer I can pull out of my hat. Thanks for the encouragement to worship as a church body. You're welcome. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Let's stand together. It says in the book of James that you have not because you ask not. And I don't know what you need today. And you may not even know what you need today. You may just have a sense that I need something. I need something to happen in my life. You may have a a real unsettled heart, uh, a confusion, or whatever the case may be. If you're a follower of Jesus, or maybe you've never yet committed your life to Jesus, but you know there's an instability, there's something there. It's okay to even come forward and just say, I'm not sure what I need, but I think there's something that God wants to do in my life. Would you pray for me? And it's an act of faith. And when we reach out to the Lord in faith, he meets with us. And so every week we're always here to pray for people, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, if you want to come forward and say, you know, I want Jesus in my life, we'd love to pray for you. So uh, we'll be here as we dismiss here. Let's sing together. I don't remember all the words, so take it away after we start. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Let's sing it again. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. God bless you guys. Hope to see you Friday here at noon if you can make it. God bless you.